So this weekend is going to be a little bit more in-depth intro to Tantra. I think most of you have a good background in Buddhism. Some of you have tons of background in Buddhism um, because it sounds like everybody um, has at least a Kriya Tantra empowerment. Is there anyone who has no empowerments whatsoever? You all have at least Kriya Tantra. That's great. Um, we can go into a bit more depth. So we'll go ahead and um, officially start and we'll set our motivation. Sange chudon sogi chunam nai janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki drola pinchi sange drupa show sange chudon sogi chunam la janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki Rola Pinchia Sange Drupa Show Sange Churam Sogi Churam La Janchu Padu Dani Kapsuchi Dagi Churian Ki Pe Sonam Ki Rola Pinchia Sange Drupa Show Just letting the motivation connect. Okay, so just so we're starting on the same page, um, we're remembering that Buddhist Tantra is for Mahayana practitioners to accelerate the path to enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And these practices, all of them, rely on having an understanding of and a conviction in the three principal aspects of the path. And I think that when we're having struggles in our tantric practice, going back to these three principal aspects of the path is a really good way to get yourself some foundation grounding and to kind of get your momentum back. So when we're looking at the three principal aspects of the path, you've of course got renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara. You've got bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment and you have correct view, the wisdom realizing emptiness. And so without these three, you're not practicing Buddhist Tantra. If you're practicing a sadhana and it's, you know, it looks like Tantra, it sounds like Tantra, if it doesn't have these three embedded in it, meaning embedded in your mind, then it's not Tantra and it's not gonna work. And so that's something that we have to keep looking at again and again. Uh, it's like, if you're having a recipe for a cake and you follow all the directions, but you forgot to turn on the oven, it's not gonna work even if all the ingredients are there because the fundamental power to bring it together is absent. So they don't work or they become dangerous. So without renunciation, Tantra just becomes another cause for samsara. Without bodhicitta, Tantra reinforces self-cherishing. And without correct view, Tantra reinforces self-grasping. So when we're just sitting with like, what is my practice so far? Like, what are the main struggles? And you're making it really specific and individual. When you want to sit down on your cushion, what gets you to want to? And when you don't want to sit on your cushion, what is it that blocks you? And you just kind of sit with, is it the absence or presence of one of the three principal aspects of the path? And I'm guessing for most of us, when we don't sit on our cushion, it's lack of renunciation. Yeah, we have a good kind heart. We have a general belief in the wisdom realizing emptiness. You know, we have a general belief that all things are lacking inherent existence. We have not probably realized that, but we believe it to be true. We see that things are dependently arisen. That makes sense. Excellent. Bodhicitta, we want to work for the welfare of all sentient beings. Excellent. Yep. Renunciation. <laughs> Renunciation feels like you're giving something up. And by sitting down, you're giving up your fun time or your relaxation time or things have to be done with work or things have to be done in the household or things have to be done so I can't sit down right now. There's always excuses 
because of the short-sightedness built into our samsaric view. So our samsaric view says, today is what you're doing and it's present in the wrong way. Of course, we're always wanting to be present, right? But without renunciation, you're present in an incorrect way. So you're present with kind of a immediate gratification mentality that says, look, I could do my practice right now. I've got time, I've got space, but I could get away with it if I don't. You know, I'm a nice enough person. I'm relaxed enough. You know, I'm friendly enough. I'm wise enough. I can get away with not doing my practice today. Instead, I'm going to do whatever, whatever. And then the days go by and the days go by and our whole life rushes away from us all of those days without practice. And it's so hard to get into the long view that says, yeah, today's practice doesn't have an obvious, tangible, immediate benefit. Some days it does, actually, but some days it doesn't. But it's the continuity of days that builds depth and power. It's the continuity of days of practice. And keeping the continuity is where so much richness and development comes from. But again, our lack of renunciation creeps in and says, I already did that, though. I already understand how that would work were I to do it. So that's as good as having already done it. I understand the psychology behind it. So what's the need to actually go through the motions? Or I don't understand this at all. I've been going through the motions and nothing has happened. So what is the point enough? It can, you know, it can kind of go either way. Kind of gives us permission to be less than we could be. Because where we are right now, we can get away with it. Do you know what I mean by get away with it? Like you are nice enough already. You're a polite person. You can do your taxes. You're, you know, you feed the dog. You speak kindly to your spouse, whatever. Like you're a nice person. You can get away with it. Um, people in your life might even think that you're kind of a deep person or kind of a spiritual person. You already have that ambiance or something. You can get away with not doing any more and still kind of have your ego satisfaction complete of being, I am a good person, I recycle, you know. And the problem is, is that if we just kind of rest on that, it doesn't mean we'll stay at that level, we actually might regress. Yeah, and just kind of staying as we are, we're not going to naturally progress and naturally get wiser with age. People who get wiser with age is because they proactively engage with the lessons of their life. Some people don't proactively engage with those lessons and stay as they are or get worse. So it's possible to get wiser as we age, but not inevitable. So we want to make sure that we're making the best use of the passage of time. So when you're asking yourself questions about renunciation, you want to ask yourself about the suffering of change. You know, you already know the Four Noble Truths. You know the three types of suffering. This is old hat. This is basic Buddhism. But do we remember how the suffering of change looks like happiness? Do we remember that? And that when you're bringing Tantra into your daily life, you can actually use the suffering of change differently and enjoy life more richly and fully on a day-to-day -day basis if you've got that basic renunciation bodhicitta correct view. So right now we have the suffering of change and it feels like pleasure and we think it feels so nice to sit down, but after a few minutes, it'll be so nice to stand up. And it feels so nice to go for a walk until we're tired and then it'll feel so nice to come back home and sit down. The suffering of change dictates the choices of our life, we know this. But with a tantric view, you're remembering my intention is to become free from samsara. With correct view, you're remembering none of this is inherently existent. And with bodhicitta, you're remembering I'm doing all of this for the welfare of all sentient beings. And so therefore, this present moment happiness, I'm going to lean into even more deeply holding those awarenesses. And then it doesn't become a trap. It becomes fuel. So you can start to use the pleasurable experiences during the day differently, rather than feeling like this is all samsara has to offer and I'm too tired to get out of samsara. So I might as well just enjoy samsara. That's kind of what we do. 
Yeah, I know samsara is not so good, but it's not the worst thing on earth. I've got a human rebirth. You know, I've got a roof over my head. I'm going to have cake. Yeah, that's kind of what our mind does. Or it says, oh, I'm so bad for having cake. I'm such a lack of renunciation person. Oh, look at me going for the suffering of change. You know, we sort of do these weird guilt trips with ourselves. With the tantric view, you say, ah, cake. Cake is a condition for happiness. It's not a cause. It's a condition. And it's not inherently pleasure. I know that. And if I believe that it is a cause for happiness, I'm going to get trapped in samsara even more. So I'm going to remember the cake is empty and I'm going to eat this delicious cake, remembering emptiness. And I'm going to give it to the guru deity who resides at my heart and feel filled with bliss and joy. And at no point am I giving credit to the cake, but I'm using the cake as a catalyst. And then if you don't have cake, you have oatmeal, oatmeal becomes a catalyst. <laughs> right? And you have a cup of tea and you ran out of milk. It's not the end of the world. The cup of tea will still work because you haven't given all the power to the object. So with the tantric view, you're using everything you already know from the sutra view, and then you're adding a layer to it. So you're saying to yourself very different things about your consumption of resources and about what's happening with your five senses. You're saying, normally I know my five senses are the doorways to all non-virtue, really. I'm craving things for the eyes, craving things for the tongue, craving things to touch, craving, craving through all of my senses. Now, how about I use the objects of craving and take the power out of them by remembering emptiness, remembering renunciation, remembering bodhicitta, and now I will use them and I will use them differently, but still access the bliss that they are a catalyst for. So then your whole life becomes Tantra. You know, you wake up in the morning and you take a shower. You're offering a shower to the deity. Yeah. And then you, you dry yourself off with a really lovely towel. Like you make sure your towels are all fresh and clean and glorious. And you pat yourself dry. You're, you're, you're offering cloth to the deity. You get dressed. You're offering divine clothes to the deity. All of, all of the little sensorial things in your day become actually much more enriching. And you can do this even if you're wearing totally boring clothes or like me, the same clothes every single day. You know, it's not about the substance, but you use the substance as a catalyst to reinforce both bliss and your awareness of emptiness. You know, and then you're walking around and then you engage with people and here's where it gets more complicated, right? You engage with people and you think, my job here is to hear all sounds as mantra. Mm, and then someone says something narky or something critical. And you think, yes, yeah, so money pay me whom I hear you. <laughs> but part of you says, doesn't really sound like mantra, sounds like criticism or sounds like nonsense. You're not trying to talk over the top of your worldly wisdom. You're trying to hold your worldly wisdom simultaneously with the tantric worldview. So the danger becomes when we're practicing Tantra in daily life that we're wrestling between ordinary wisdom and Tantra wisdom and like we have to choose when really you're holding parallel truths and you're just staying with them both. And you're recognizing that because we haven't realized emptiness yet, all appearances are deceptive. But we do understand emptiness, even though we haven't realized it, which means the space of infinite possibility is opening up to us a bit more. And everyone has Buddha nature. So what you're doing is you're trying to lean into the fact of their Buddha nature as who they are more than their afflictions. Right now, we identify people as their personalities and their bodies and our interactions with them and all sorts of very superficial things, which are new, which are dependently arisen, which are not them. And we think this is them. If you go deeper and you think, all right, they are just merely labeled on the collection of aggregates, that doesn't give you really a sense of anything to engage with, even though that's true. So with the Tantra view, what you're trying to do is say, they are empty of inherent existence and from emptiness, they will arise as a Buddha eventually. So I'm gonna to relate to them as the Buddha they will be. 
because the potentiality for that is already there in this present moment. And time itself is a dependent arising. So these are all very kind of cosmic philosophical ideas, but when you're walking around in daily life, you're thinking this person has the relative aspect that I'm engaging with, which will be totally deceptive because my mind creates the deception because of my innate ignorance. And this person has an ultimate nature, which is their emptiness. So I'm gonna notice both things and I'm gonna choose to engage with, with what is closer to truth. And seeing them as the deity is actually closer to truth than seeing them as their afflictions. Do you feel what I'm saying? So it's not like you're ignoring the fact that they're being critical and grumpy and awful, and it doesn't mean you become a doormat and you can still be assertive or still be skillful or do whatever you need to do in terms of worldly wisdom, but you're seeing it as the display that it is. You're seeing it much more like a movie that you're half interested in rather than the movie you've been sucked into and you believe the drama as real. So is this a bit like, um, is this a bit like with the teaching on the two truths? I remember Geshe Tashi talking about, um, you know, the seeing um, sort of the dependent arising and the emptiness and seeing those two truths um, as the two aspects, two sides of the same coin. So is it something like that? Yeah, exactly. It's just kind of the elevated way of engaging with that teaching. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with all pretty much all teachings in Buddhism, they're going to go into a category of like the basis, the mm -hmm. path or the result, right? Mm -hmm. And the basis is going to be like the Buddhist science, psychology, philosophy, just how things are category, the basis. Mm -hmm. And the basis is the two truths. Right. So the two truths, conventional truth and ultimate truth, are just how things are, right? Conventional truth is truth for people who haven't realized emptiness, right? So it's not true, right? And ultimate truth is emptiness. But that's just the way things are. What do you do with that material? You know, that becomes the path, right? Method and wisdom. And the result of that is the Buddha bodies. So the reason why Tantra is so much quicker than Sutra is that it has practices that correlate with the result much more directly. Yeah, much more directly. So taking the result as the path, this whole Tantric psychology is something that is very delicate because without a fundamental conventional sanity, you get really weird really quickly, or you get really disappointed really quickly. You know, or, you know, you sort of start to think in overly idealistic sort of rose colored glasses terms or very kind of egocentric weirdo terms or, you know, it can really go the wrong way really easily. Or if you're, you know, fairly grounded, but you would take these things the wrong way, then you think, all right, that's a nice imagination. That's a nice picture to have in my head. And yeah, I can think of people in that way. And then what? You know, and you can get kind of disappointed and kind of a let down feeling. And is that it? And of course, it's not it, but it's something that then becomes integrated with the sadhana practice and the use of the channels, winds, and drops in the body. And it all starts to merge together really beautifully. And then we bring in the conversation of the guru. So you know, it's, it's something that when you're in the experimental trial phase of any class of Tantra, it's going to feel a bit silly. <laughs> yeah. Or it's going to feel a little bit too far away or too mystical or too magical. Or it's going to feel like some kind of pop psychology, positive thinking nonsense. And it's really easy to get kind of disillusioned. And then you see the lamas or you see advanced practitioners and you think, they are amazing. There's obviously more going on than what I've understood, but no one is explaining it to me. You know that feeling, right? So you're like, so obviously it's more than pop psychology. Obviously it's more than some sort of mystical thinking that just is like helpful because look at them. They have like a presence and a stability and just kind of like a radiating open heart about them that is different to normal people, yes. And you think, how did they get that way? Apparently through Tantra. What are they doing? <laughs> you know? 
And the sadhanas, you know, when you read the sadhanas, the practice manuals of any class of Tantra, at first you're kind of like, oh, is that it? I thought Tantra was this amazing, secret, profound, you know, complex, what, what? It's just refuge in bodhicitta and the four immeasurable thoughts then seven limb prayer and then some nice visualization and some mantra and then I'm done. So, all right, that's nice, but where's the magic, right? Can happen, can happen. And part of it is that it is an oral tradition. Part of it is also that these short sadhanas, these practice manuals that were given, these are like an outer scaffolding for a much larger picture that only the commentaries reveal or the longer sadhanas show. So these very short practices that were given are not meant to be done on their own, divorced from the context, the commentary and long sadhana. They're more ones that advanced practitioners use to remind them of the longer sadhana and the commentaries. But in this day and age, it's the other way around. We get these short versions and sometimes that's the only version we ever see. And we wonder where, where's the rest, <laughs> you know? And you have to really dig and ask and request and hunt for the longer versions and the commentaries. And you have to be proactive with your llamas and say, I would like a commentary on dot, 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 you know? And then it's quite profound thing, but you have to be proactive and ask. And if they say no, ask again later, you know? Don't badger them, obviously, but, you know, just keep asking and that creates the cause to get a lot of these teachings that we've been missing over time. So just speaking personally, and I'm guessing a lot of you will resonate with this, at first having experiential teachings like Lama Yeshi's Intro to Tantra is very inspiring. It's just really inspiring. It's so beautiful. And then after a while, the inspiration turns into okay, but how though, <laughs> right? And then you switch to kind of Geshe style, which will involve a lot of lists. Yes, a lot of lists and a lot of definitions, perhaps some charts, some debate, some logic, some technical jargon, some all, you know, it gets very scholarly very quickly. And you think, okay, so that's how, but that's a little intimidating. And, you know, you think I'm a smart person, I can learn things, but how are they even using English? That's even not a normal way to use English. What? You know, and you get kind of um, stifled. Yeah, because you kind of have this great inspiration. And then you look at the technical stuff. And it's really what? And what you need to do, or at least what's worked for me in the past is to pivot between those two. And to know that you need teachers who do to one or the other or both, but to seek out both. So I have some teachers that speak only magically, only inspirationally, beautifully and profoundly. I have no idea what they're saying half the time, but I'm very happy about it. You know, I'm happy, I'm uplifted, I'm joyful. Could not tell you a straight sentence after three hours of teachings. It's just an experience, yeah. And then I have some teachers who are much more Geshe style and there are detailed points and those points add the structure to the inspiration. So just kind of like look at your tantric practice very strategically and say, I need a bit of structure, I need a bit of inspiration and I need to pivot back and forth, structure, inspiration, structure, inspiration at a pace that works for you, but also a pace that is just just gently pushing you, not at all painfully, not at all forcefully, not in a way that's going to trigger guilt and shame and all that nonsense, but just a little bit of momentum. And then if you have your tiny little short sadhana, you start to add some layers to it. Yeah, so you'll say your refuge in bodhicitta, which seems like your same refuge in bodhicitta you've seen the whole time, you realize, oh, there's a beautiful merit field specific to this deity. And there's a whole visualization and way of approaching it. And there's a whole meditation that goes with it. Oh, okay, so I'm going to do my refuge and bodhicitta prayer, plus all of this commentary I've learned about it. And then the rest of the sadhana as written, nice and gentle. And then you learn a little bit about the next section. And you kind of expand that out and do a little bit more there. And eventually you have a way of expanding each section of your tiny little three page sadhana. Doesn't mean you have to do it in the expanded way every single time, 
it means you've got options. You think, okay, this month I'm giving all of my energy to the mantra visualization and I'm gonna do the rest of it in an abbreviated way. And then the next month, I'm gonna give all of my energy to the purification section and do the rest of it in an abbreviated way. So it's a way of staying very engaged with the same practice day after day after day, but not getting overwhelmed by all the millions of things you could do with it. Yeah, so you're not putting pressure on yourself, but you're also keeping it alive and rich. And when there's parts of it that you keep getting stuck on every time, don't feel like that's a blockage. Feel like that's an invitation to ask a good question the next time your llamas come to town. You know, and you just save up your llama question list. Simple as that. And, um, you know, that's something I need to check on. And you just keep asking until you get the answer. And sometimes even just clarifying the question, the answer comes to you through some book you're reading. So half the battle is getting your questions clear, I think. Yeah, Max, go ahead. Oh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I love your explanation. I mean, the aspect of it of really kind of feeling how you feel into your own world and type of experience. But the thing that I always find most difficult um, around a lot of it is things, especially around the mandala, because the aspects around the architecture just so could taken from kind of Indian culture, certain aspects of it. And they're going off, off and also offering the precious yeah. elephant, the precious queen, the precious minister stuff like that. I mean, I appreciate the beauty because I love the aesthetics of enlightenment and I, I'm into art and, enlight and I love that stuff. I can appreciate it. But I'm also offering, you know, the um, just the, you know, yeah, the kind of different cosmological aspects of it. Don't resonate. Yeah. It. So, I mean, I get some people have tried some new stuff. So look, I don't know, they have some kind of quasi slightly kind of new age kind of quantum mechanic idea and such and so forth. But I don't, the, the, some of the cosmologies and some of the mandalas and the, ar the actual architecture of that I find quite difficult because it doesn't it doesn't resonate with my kind of like cultural experience. Like yeah. I think I look at the like uh, yaktail fans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yak what, don't fans. you have yaktail fans at your house? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe I need to start. But uh, I just it was that special thing about yaktail fans. I thought yeah. I'm not sure I have to relate with that. Rolls from sea monsters and yeah. 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 No, it, I know. And and the thing is, it's a little bit like um. I don't know if your teachers ever told you in school that once you know the rules, then you can know which ones you can break, right? And it is a little bit like that where just because it's unfamiliar doesn't mean there's not profundity there. Of course, you know that, but to, to kind of study the mandala enough to know what is the essence of each of those things and what they represent, then you can start to play with it a little bit and say, Okay, for me, you know, uh, this balustrade and this scaffolding and all of these architectural terms I had to study because I became a tantric practitioner. I'm not an architect. I don't know what a balustrade is. You know, whatever, like all these things that you have to look up when you're doing these big long sadhanas with these big elaborate mandalas is that when you read the commentary, you realize this is symbolic of this, this is symbolic of that. And it actually becomes quite a magical thing and then you can kind of gently play with the parts that you can play with and then stay firm with the parts you should stay firm with. But when you're offering a mandala, yeah, as opposed to visualizing the mandala of the deity, when you're offering a mandala of the universe and that cosmology, that is really just saying everything that is beautiful and wonderful in the universe, I offer to you the guru deity. So that you can already start to play with a little bit and weaving in the fact that the 37 aspects of enlightenment and your practice itself is the main thing the teacher wants. Yeah, what's the best present? It's not the Yaktel fan, it's not the precious minister, it's what those things represent, the practice. You know, so you think I'm offering my practice and it's symbolic of the beautiful things in the universe, like those fireworks I saw that one time, like that beautiful meadow I drove by getting here, like this, like this, like this, you know? So, so you can already start to play with that one, but in terms of the mandalas of the deities, that kind of sacred geometry, there is something profound in, in holding the structure of that, but it's way more fun if you learn the commentary, because otherwise you're just in this weird, weird house with four doors. You feel like this is terrible feng shui. Why is there four doors? <laughs> you know, and you get all kind of like, what? And why are the walls different colors and et cetera, et cetera. So, so don't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because there is that invitation to be a bit artistic and playful with some parts of it. 
other parts really do try and be as traditional as you can be, but with a really flexible mind. Like I, I try and think about, I don't know, I was, uh, um, Russia's on my mind, of course, because Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. And I was remembering when I visited Russia, those beautiful churches were really different to the churches in the United States. And they didn't have as much stained glass windows. They had more mosaics and different kind of art. And when I walked in, I didn't really have any expectation of them or need of them. I was just curious. And, and that's the kind of view I try and take into the mandala is to be just curious. You're like, huh, so over here's a blue wall. <laughs> so over here's a yellow wall, you know? And if you have that really flexible mind, then it doesn't feel like um, a pressure that's imposed. You know, it can feel a lot more playful. So kind of take your tourist, curious kind of mindset to it. And then you're weaving in the practices that they're embodying and then it has so much richness. So some of the mandala stuff ties into the conversation about the five Buddha families and we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. So um, we'll come back to it, but the five Buddha families really helps this whole thing feel a lot more rich and um, accessible. Yeah. yeah, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just I'm just kind of preempt a question. You may actually get to it, so maybe it's not here now, but I'm also thinking about the more my kind of practice deepens, the more I realize how, how body based of my practice is, but mm. also how separate that is from the land. And so, I mean, some of the ways I think about the way some of the ways that I've been, well, first introduced to Tantra is very kind of, I don't know, type of kind of just cerebral, so disengaged from the body, so disengaged from the land. And I think about, you know, I think as you know, some practitioners. When they're practiced that, that their experience will be separate from the land and now they appreciate the land and how they work with the land and how they imagine with the land and nature spirits and so forth things like that so i'm just thinking about so i'm i'm, I'm here in the northeast of england it's a beautiful place and i'm, I'm practicing tantra um but the relationship i have with it with the land mm. it arises in a particular way and that may arise in a way which is not so i don't see many so i practiced chair for many years mm. I, practiced chair. I don't i've never i've never met many um tibetan demons up in the northeast of england not gonna, but they no, are and, and the thing is is that like protector practice and um i don't know just kind of awareness of protector spirits they don't have to be um the ones that were subdued in tibet and converted to buddhism you know but every land does have okay. landlord spirits right like every indigenous culture in the world knows about deity it's at the end of the day it doesn't have to be all of those very specific tibetan um names but that respectful attitude is the main thing Brilliant. yeah so it's related to the related to the specific elements um so is there a correlation in that also to how we dissolve in the death process prior to dissolving into emptiness correlation mm -hmm. could you comment on that please well i mean I think that you're already there, you know, the link is, is already there in your mind. It, it, we are built from the elements, the same elements that build the earth. It's all completely related. And so when you're practicing Tantra, you are manipulating the elements in your body, you know, the air, water, fire, wind, everything is being manipulated in your body. There, there is such a, a benefit to just your breath having mantras associated with it. And then that breath going out, even if you have no realizations, the mantras are so powerful that your breath becomes blessed. You can start to feel when you're doing these mantras that there's more going on than you are specifically controlling. There's some sort of alignment happening. Sometimes there's some release and some energy that can happen. And you just try and say, that's very interesting, but it's not something I'm gonna get fixated on because the point is to become enlightened. You know, and so these interesting energetic experiences are showing me that this mantra has an effect, but I'm not gonna get lost in the experience because bodhicitta, bodhicitta, bodhicitta. Yeah. So gently, gently. But um, do you need a quick stretch and then we'll dig into some content and maybe do a little meditation? 15 minutes? Okay. See you 15 minutes. <laughs> 